Hello, Las Vegas. Welcome to Fertility Thursdays with NFI. I'm Dr. Cindy Duke, Medical Director and Physician here at the Nevada Fertility Institute. Today, I am really pleased and excited because I'm being joined by Catherine L. Provost. Catherine is a an attorney here in the Las Vegas area, and she specializes in family law in particular when it comes to our area of interest. She works closely with families and patients who are interested in forming families but need some assistance, whether it be with donor sperm egg or the use of a gestational surrogate. I am going to have Catherine tell us everything that we wanted to know, every question we've ever asked, everything we've ever wondered about. And Catherine, thank you so much for joining us. Oh, it's my pleasure. I'm excited to be here. And thank you very much for the opportunity to talk to everyone live. So yes, let's get that's going. great. So before we get started, tell us, how did you get into this field and what made you interested in doing it? Well, I have been a family law attorney in Las Vegas for the last 15 years. Uh, and for the first 10 of that, my practice was traditional family law. Um, so everything from traditional divorce to uh, child custody, termination of parental rights, and uh, some adoption work. Um, most of my adoption work has was centered on step parents or second parent uh, mm -hmm. adoption cases. Um, and then about five years ago, uh, from another attorney in Nevada who was working in the uh, family formation part of this assisted reproductive technology field, uh, it, often you'll hear it called art, art law. Um, she is the one who introduced me to it and I just absolutely fell in love with it. So now for the last five years, um, I still do have a, uh, my firm is a family law firm, we do everything, but I have a good portion of my practice that's devoted to assisting uh, with forming families through the use of different uh, reproductive technologies. So. That is so amazing. And I'm so incredibly grateful that you have chosen to do this. I mean, as the physician who meets patients uh, who come in, navigating this fertility journey is difficult in of, of itself. But if you needed to obtain like eggs, sperm, or for the couples who end up needing to use uh, surrogate, it can be quite challenging. And there's just so many angles that you can do this from. It's really important that you have somebody like you who can help. So I'm gonna ask some questions. We also have uh, patients who can ask us questions and I encourage that guys, if you're able to um, join us. But I have some questions that I also have been collecting for Catherine. And so I'm going to jump right into that. And of course, just keep sending us your questions and we'll answer those as well. And so my first question has to do with the whole pros pros process involved in using donor egg, donor sperm, and the routes that one can use. And so I guess the first question that most people out there might be wanting to ask is, is it legal to use donated eggs and sperm in the United States? Well, I'm a Nevada attorney, so I can't speak nationwide. Um, family law, including family formation or art law, uh, is state specific. So mm -hmm. every state has its own set of law, its own set of requirements, or a lack of law, in which case people operate in what I call a gray area, mm -hmm. meaning it's not illegal to do it, but right. you don't have a law that says you can't. Mm -hmm. What's wonderful about Nevada is that in 2013, um, our gestational carrier statutes were drafted and our family statutes dealing with third party reproduction were updated. Um, and in Nevada, it is absolutely legal to use donor sperm, mm -hmm. donor egg, or even a donor embryo. Um, absolutely yes. no problem whatsoever with that. Okay, great. And what is the general process if you were talking to someone who was simply interested in using donor sperm, for example? So let's say we're talking about a patient who's either a single female or a woman in a same sex relationship or a woman who's in a heterosexual relationship with partner for one reason or another is not making sperm, how would you advise them to go about the process of selecting a sperm donor? Should it be someone they know? Should it be an anonymous donor? Or is it is there even an option that's in between? Well, it's really, um, it's a personal decision. Every single family journey is different. 
Mm -hmm. um, I can't say one way or the other that one is better than the other. In Nevada, mm -hmm. we really don't care. You can use a known donor. You can use a friend. You can use a donor that has come from a clinic. You can mm -hmm. do, uh, use a donor that's come from a cryo bank facility um, where they have a, a large number of donor sperm available. Mm -hmm. uh, all of that is possible here in Nevada. Um, it's a question, a personal question. Um, some of the things to consider is if you're going to use a friend or a known donor, what type of a role do you see that person having in the mm -hmm. future? Um, mm -hmm. You know, are they going to donate and then you're going to keep it from, let's say you're successful and you're able to have a child that way. Are you going to keep it from the child that this person that they come in contact all the time really is their biological uh, father, the person who donated mm -hmm. donated the sperm to, to bring that child into creation. Those are those types of questions that you really need to have a good uh, feeling for and a good answer when you're thinking about using someone who's a, who is known to you, who may still have a role in the child's life. Mm -hmm. um, if you're using an anonymous donor, um, whether that is someone you found yourself or someone that you found through a clinic, um, then you don't have necessarily that problem where you're going to come in contact. Now, that's not to say that uh, an anonymous donor stays anonymous, right. um, especially now there's a pretty big movement in the United States. Um, and it's in my opinion, and this is just my own personal view, um, it's a movement to look at the child's need to know where the child came from more so than the parent's decision to make that decision on behalf of the child of who, whether or not the child's going to know about their own genetics. Um, we have a donor sibling registry that's mm -hmm. been developed here in the United States um, through things. I mean, we're talking to you here live uh, uh, um, via the Internet. Um, you know, we all know how easy it is now to find out and search someone out on Facebook. You don't need a whole lot of information to track that's someone true. down. Mm -hmm. So the concept of a true anonymous donor may not be as strong as it used to be. And if you leave the United States in, uh, in other countries, they really do look at it from the right of the child to know their parentage, um, as opposed to here in the United States, in many places, it's the right of the parent to make the determination. So those are some considerations. That's, good. that's very good information, especially because I would say as a physician, that's one of the discussions I end up having with my patients, which is, one, should it be a known donor or an anonymous donor? What are the differences? And indeed, if you were going down the path of selecting someone you know, how should you do it? I, for one, always counsel my patients that they should talk to an attorney to at least figure out the legal framework for the discussion they've had. So if it's a known donor, of course you're going to talk to that person, he's going to say whether or not he agrees, you're going to talk about the general views, what is his view of his role, what is your view of his role, but I certainly encourage my patients to see an attorney and talk with them and maybe even craft a, a document that sort of lays that all out, but do you think that's required or do you also recommend that they do that? So in Nevada, we have a statute that de defines what a donor is. And a donor is someone who does not intend to be a parent to the child. They intend to give their uh, donation of sperm and then not have any of the attachments of parentage. Um, the best practices that I could recommend would be that you do have a, if you're using a known donor, that you have a known sperm donor agreement prepared by an attorney, signed and notarized by all parties. So then mm -hmm. that way we identify who is involved and what the intent is. And with that, that person should qualify under our state statute as a donor and could not then come back and change his mind about wanting to say that he wants to have a view, a role in the child's life, um, nor would that person have to worry about a consideration of child support in the case of, you know, uh, a family maybe being formed in this manner and the woman who is using the donor sperm has no intent of ever seeking child support from the donor. But if in the case that that woman ends up on welfare or needs some assistance from the state, mm -hmm. the state isn't going to care. If the woman knows who was the father of the child and gives that name, the state could come after that donor. 
Um, and that example has happened uh, in at least in the state of Kansas, and there was some a lot of litigation over that. Yes. So, in from a lawyer's perspective, which I'm speaking to you as, the best practices are that you do have a known sperm donor agreement uh, between all of the parties involved. Um, and if you go uh, and do a consultation with an attorney who deals in assisted reproductive technologies, we can sit down with you. We can let you know why you should do that, what it looks like, what the costs are involved. Um, and then if you decided that you didn't want to go that route, letting you know what your risks are. Um, mm -hmm. So you can at least make an informed and educated decision if you choose not to follow best practices. Right. And is there a cost? So are there typical costs for seeing or consulting with an attorney for something like this? Um, I can only speak to myself. Mm -hmm. um, I do charge a consultation fee. Mm -hmm. um, if I'm going to spend an hour with you, then my consultation fee is $475. Um, I, I block that time aside. I'm not doing other work. I'm not taking other calls. Mm -hmm. That time is just one-on-one -on -one for whomever I'm consulting with, whether it be the the uh, recipient intended parent, whether it be the donor. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, to me, it's best to know what you're going to be dealing with before mm -hmm. you enter the process. You know, all of these family formation uh, processes, they're not inexpensive. And wow. unfortunately, they're not typically the road that people choose to go down. You've gone right. through a lot mm -hmm. if you're mm -hmm. already here. Yeah. Um, and, and a lot of it is unknown. It's just so, uncharted territory, really. It is. I mean, mm -hmm. the, the, the law is ever-changing in the art field, just yeah. like the medicine is, is mm -hmm. ever-changing. Mm -hmm. um, and so the importance, number one, is to use someone, just like you would, you know, you spend time looking for a doctor that you're going to yes. trust, someone yeah. who's well-educated in the mm -hmm. field. Same thing with an attorney. You know, mm -hmm. having a, a license to practice law in the state of Nevada doesn't mean that you're good at everything. I mean, I, I have a license. I can practice in any field, mm -hmm. but I'm not going to go out and defend my best friend on her, you know, car accident case. And I'm not going to go out and, you know, God forbid if someone in my family called me and said, hey, I've been arrested, go and try to defend them in their criminal case because that's not my field. Um, Very you know, accurate. Yes. You just want to find true. someone you trust mm -hmm. and who's well educated and yes. who can give you the best advice. And tell us about. ARTA, A-A-R-T-A, what does that mean? And if a patient, I certainly tell patients that's one way to start figuring out or narrowing down the options in terms of an attorney. What does ARTA mean, A-A-R-T-A? Okay. So ARTA is the American Academy of Reproductive Technology Attorneys. Mm -hmm. um, ARTA, it was a, a separate arm of the American Academy of Adop Adoption Attorneys, mm -hmm. also called Quad A. Um, they are now fully merged. Mm -hmm. And so uh, if you were to go to my website and look me up, mm -hmm. um, you would see a little symbol that says, I am a fellow, an art fellow mm -hmm. of the American Academy of Adoption Attorneys, Quad A. ARTA um, is the, was a separate subset. Mm -hmm. Now it's all combined into one. Oh, but ARTA okay. are the Assistive Reproductive Technologies Attorneys. Mm -hmm. Quad A are the adoption attorneys, and some people are both. Okay. Um, I am not an adoption attorney. I don't spend enough time in my practice. I'm knowledgeable about adoption, mm -hmm. but I just don't devote my practice to adoption. I do family formation yes. through uh, assisted reproductive technologies. Excellent, excellent. Now, is there anything that I didn't ask you specific to this area that you feel patients should know or those who are exploring the option uh, to, that they should know? As far as the um, donor, donor sperm, okay. donor egg, and how that all works. Um, well, the, the biggest thing I would say is it's important to know where your donor is coming from. You know, again, the internet is wonderful, and there are things like Craigslist, and there are things mm -hmm. like, um, uh, you know, internet groups or, or uh, Facebook groups for people that want to be donors or yes. people that are looking for donors. Mm -hmm. um, the problem with that it's, is that you hope everyone on there is well-intentioned, but you can't guarantee it. You know, everybody puts on their best face on Facebook, mm -hmm. right? You know, mm -hmm. we all, you know, no, yeah. one, most people are not going to sit there and tell you, Hey, these are my backstories or my problems right. on that. Yes. Um, and so you don't, if you're taking the risk of just finding someone online, you don't know where they're coming from. Um, and then depending on how you, you, 
use the donor's material, in other words, if you decide you want to go the at-home insemination route, yeah, you have a donor that you found online. They tell they they look good, they sound okay, but they have not had any of the medical testing done to know that number one. Um, their samples are viable for use or number two, that they're not carrying any type of genetic problems or communicable diseases. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, that's a that's a big concern because when you're going with the clinic, that's one of the big. Uh, things that's one that of the first there. things that we check. And, you know, I I like that you've brought that up because that's something that we emphasize in the realm of fertility clinics and OBGYN clinics. Part of your preconception or that first visit as you're planning to get pregnant is performing certain laboratory studies, including tests for things like HIV, hepatitis, syphilis, gonorrhea, chlamydia. And certainly if you were going to do even an at-home insemination with sperm from someone that you know, that person should also be tested for the same things, one. Uh, the second is one test is never enough. So what you have to recall is if this donor is known to you, it's still someone who is otherwise most likely sexually active in their lives. And so their activities, their uh, choices can impact you once you use their semen um, because the difference with an at-home insemination, for example, versus one performed at a clinic, is at the clinic we do washes and all those things related to the semen. That is not what's happening at home. And washing, by the way, does not prevent infection, but that's why we also do those other tests as required by the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration. It's also why I, when I counsel patients on the difference between an anonymous donor and a known donor, that's one of the differences I like to highlight. So the sperm banks or the egg banks here in the United States are governed by laws and under statutes that are dictated by the FDA. And so uh, they have to screen their donors. Donors have to undergo very rigorous screening. For example, a sperm donor has to be tested at least twice, at least six months apart. So even after he's donated sperm to the sperm bank, they keep it frozen for six months in quarantine until he's retested to ensure that he has not now become positive for HIV or hepatitis or syphilis or gonorrhea, chlamydia. So that's something that I'm glad you brought up because that's a big, big consideration. And it is not um, unheard of that someone does become infected from going the route of using known uh, specimen, known donor sperm. And the whole key to that is being cautious, following those steps, even if it's someone you know, getting the requisite testing done, go see, if not a fertility specialist, go see your primary care doctor or your OBGYN. Certainly if you go to a fertility clinic, they're very familiar with the process and what tests need to be done so they can be thorough for you. And you know, they say an ounce of prevention is so much more better than how many other ounces of cure. And so that's something that we encourage. So I'm glad you brought that up because that is true. Um, let's go on now to talk about donor egg, which is a more nuanced uh, conversation, but it's one that does come up. And uh, for many people, for many women, even arriving at the decision to use donor eggs is a really tough one. Not that donor sperm isn't a tough decision too, but donor egg does also mean you have to reconcile with the reality that your own egg numbers have now diminished to a point where it may make better sense to use donor egg. And so for many women, what they're torn between is whether to use eggs from an anonymous donor or someone that they know. And if you could, I'm sure a lot of it does dovetail with the same from the sperm, but if you can speak to donor egg a little bit and what you've seen. You know, it, it similar considerations. Um, actually, I find, I, I have actually found women more, once they get used to the idea that they do have to use a donor, mm -hmm. I found women more comfortable with a known donor. Yeah. And the reason I think is that, um, you know, when they're going to use a known donor, 
they tend to use someone that is either related mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. a really good friend who they know is going to mm -hmm. love this child that's going to come into this world as much as they yeah. are. Mm -hmm. um, and I find that the donor is typically wanting to help. You know, they see their family member struggling with infertility mm -hmm. or their best friend. And they're mm -hmm. like, you know, I can help. I mm -hmm. can let me help. I can mm -hmm. help. Mm -hmm. um, and so I actually find that uh, once they get past that, at yeah. least from my experience, they're mm -hmm. comfortable with that. Now there are plenty of, uh, anonymous donors out there mm -hmm. um, and I've done plenty of uh, arrangements mm -hmm. for use of donor eggs both in uh, gestational surrogacy arrangements yes. mm -hmm. as well as in just uh, families that require mm -hmm. the use of donor eggs so mm -hmm. it again it's their choice of which way they want to go um, I just find that a lot of women are comfortable with that with that that's good to know um, in terms of the document is it okay to use a notarized document when you know crafting a donor or family arrangement for any of these reasons is it enough to say you know what i got it notarized and now i'm good oh it's better than nothing um again it's not best practices and i couldn't recommend you to rely on that um it will sh help show intent if later on your donor comes back and wants mm -hmm. to establish their own parentage mm -hmm. or claims to your child. Mm -hmm. um, but is it enough to be fully protective? My answer to that is probably no. Mm -hmm. um, in Nevada, we do allow for um, parentage agreements to be signed. Um, and one of the things that you see is in a same-sex female-female uh, couple, um, you know, one may carry and one may donate the egg and they mm -hmm. both want to be recognized as parents and we have uh, the ability to do that and uh, document that in a legal agreement that mm -hmm. will recognize both as co-parents of that child, regardless of whose genetic material it might be or which one is going to carry. Um, you know, we, we were talking a little bit earlier um, before we came online and I said, you know, the analogy of it is, do you want to meet with your lawyer and have them be the pilot right. and have them, you know, know where you're going, mm -hmm. have a set plan of how to get you there safely, know that when you arrive, everything that you expected is going to be there? Mm -hmm. Or would you rather have your attorney be the janitor and, you know, you've done it in a different route and you come to the attorney after there's a problem and the attorney has to clean up the mess? Well. A janitor does a great job, but sometimes they can't get out all the stains, meaning that you know they can't solve that problem. Um, so again, like you had said, the ounce of pre uh, prevention, prevention, yeah, is it's better it's, than the cure. Exactly, that's true. Now I have a question here. It's a private message that we received, right. and um, it says, "Can you? Will you discuss the process if you want to donate your eggs?" And so I think that's the first thing, I guess, if there's someone watching right now and maybe she's been talking to a family member or a friend and she's interested in donating her eggs, what should she do? Um, I would say that she needs to decide how she wants to donate. And a great first step would be contacting a clinic that has a donor program. And I believe that you would, your program is now off and running. Or Yes, we're about, about to be. We're working about on About to it. be up and running. So um, they could call the Nevada Fertility Institute and ask about their donor program mm -hmm. um, or look at a donor egg agency that mm -hmm. has an established mm -hmm. donor program or other clinics that have an established donor program. Um, that would be step one. Um, then they would be put through certain screening. And I'll allow you to talk a little bit more about yes. that. Mm -hmm. um, and then at the once they know that they're qualified to be a donor at that point, that's when they would talk to a lawyer and start the legal process. They can talk to a lawyer at any time, but mm -hmm. there's not other than giving some advice and telling them, hey, go find, go research, find who you're comfortable yeah. working with for mm -hmm. your donor cycle. Mm -hmm. um, there's not much that a lawyer can do until we know that they're qualified. Right. Yes. So I'll talk about the qualification a little bit. And that's the other part of that question in the message. The question says, how does it work legally? Say I give 12 eggs. Do they pay by the egg or do they test the eggs to know they're healthy? And are you only paid if the eggs are healthy? And the short answer is there's no per egg uh, program out there. So 
when you agree to donate your eggs, your agreement has to do with all the eggs being donated from that donation cycle. And a cycle basically means that as a donor, you take special medications, injectable medications, you're followed with ultrasounds and blood work, and when the eggs are ready, they're all retrieved or harvested, and that's considered a donation. So whatever number is part of that is the donation in that one cycle. Now, there are women who do those multiple rounds, but each round is a cycle. Mm -hmm. In terms of qualifying to be a donor, uh, each clinic has some different rules, but there are general things that have to occur based on uh, FDA and other guidelines. And so one first thing that has to happen is the young woman, the woman interested in donating eggs, and typically donors are between the age of 21 and 30, uh, typically. Um, she first undergoes an intake where you know she's asked questions about her interests, why is she interested, what's her general health history. She's asked questions about her family history, if she has children, about her children's medical history. Uh, she's asked information that is aimed at gauging her general well-being, her general psychological state, and then she, if she passes that initial screening, for want of a better term. Um, she's then, uh, if it's through a donor agency, some agencies will actually have her do some blood work, and then after that, they would say yes or no, you qualify. For others, they then present you to potential recipients. So just in terms of terminology, a donor is someone who is willing to donate egg or sperm to someone else, or a couple, and the person receiving is known as a recipient. And so if you're the person who is obtaining eggs donated from someone else, you're known as a recipient. And for that reason, they may present her profile to the recipient or candidate recipients, and they will decide if this uh, person matches the criteria that they were looking for. And criteria are based on things like, uh, eye color, hair color, ethnic background, uh, it, it varies, but different patients select their uh, criteria. Good night, Sherry Ann, good night. Um, and so that's the general selection criteria. In terms of compensation, uh, donors can be compensated here in the United States. Uh, it all depends, again, on, on your state. State law takes precedence, and so your clinic, the individual clinic in that state, will know the answer for them. Um, in terms of how much you're compensated, that again is determined by states, it's determined by the agency you're working with. So that's more of a private conversation that happens between the person who's interested in donating eggs and the recipient or the donor program. Absolutely, absolutely. You know, it, it's, I even have donors that are willing to do it uh, altruistically, meaning mm -hmm. that they're not asking for compensation, yeah. um, especially in a, a known donor situation exactly. that happens a lot. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. That's not to say there's not costs involved for the recipient parent. The recipient parent still is likely going to be responsible for the cost of the medical process, for example, or the cost of the medications, yes. yeah. the cycle medications to get you ready for your donation. Mm -hmm. um, but the, there is no uh, set restriction on mm -hmm. the the cost that you can ask someone to pay to yes. if you want to donate your eggs mm -hmm. um but it can be it can widely vary from you know zero to choose a number yeah um and that's a really a very uh, personal discussion to have with it. your known donor if you're in a known donor situation or if you're in a situation where you want to be a donor that's a discussion that you have with the clinic that you're working with mm -hmm. or with the egg donor agency that you're working yes. with mm -hmm. um and uh, that, that's how those decisions get made. I agree. Um, another question that's come in, this one uh, says, will donating one to two times damage my ability to have children in the future? And the short answer is no. Uh, in terms of egg donation, we're not taking eggs that you would have used in 10 years or so. Again, the process or round of IVF, whether you're doing it for your own ovaries or this is someone who's donating, 
when we get those eggs, those are the eggs that were being recruited to be used up by your ovary that month. And so that's really all that we're taking from. We're taking from a pool of eggs that were going to be used that month. We're not really going into a storehouse and taking out what's being stored. Uh, so that's the short answer is no. Um, however, that's part of the screen. If we screen you and notice that you don't have a lot of eggs to begin with, that actually will mean that you're not a good candidate to donate eggs. And so most people who are interested in becoming a donor may then become ineligible after that screen looking at their egg number. Okay, let's see if we have any other questions. Um, we also had a few other things that I wanted to make sure we cover with Catherine before uh, we are all done today. And so Catherine, you know, if you're willing, we are excited to have you come back so we can talk all about surrogacy. But I did have a few questions to ask, which is, for example, I've been using the word surrogacy. You've been terming it gestational carrier. And so for those watching, is there a difference between a surrogate and a gestational carrier? Okay, so this is a matter of terminology. Uh, the general term surrogacy can apply to both what's called traditional surrogacy or using a gestational carrier or gestational carrier arrangements, gestational surrogacy. Okay. Um, Traditional surrogacy, or when you're in the art field and you're using the word surrogate, that is someone who is using their own genetic material and going to be carrying that child mm -hmm. on behalf of someone else. So it's a woman who is utilizing her own egg uh, in connection with donor sperm, mm -hmm. um, and the child is created. Uh, sometimes they will do that uh, through IVF, meaning right. creating the embryo and then re into mm -hmm. the surrogate. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes they will do that through IUI and intrauterine insemination mm -hmm. by just introducing the sperm into the into the surrogate. Mm -hmm. uh, and then that surrogate utilizes her own genetic material to carry to create a child and carry it to term and then relinquish that child to the intended parents. Mm -hmm. um, Nevada does not have a traditional surrogacy statute. So it is not illegal here, but we also don't have a law to rely on. Correct. And therefore, and we certainly don't recommend it. Yeah. So like therefore, it's not yeah. recommended. <laughs> um, we in Nevada are fortunate to have a wonderful gestational carrier statute. Mm -hmm. So a gestational carrier is a woman who is going to be uh, become pregnant by the implantation of an embryo into her uterus, and she is not genetically related to that child in any way. And then she carries that child uh, to term and gives birth and relinquishes that child to the mm -hmm. intended parents. Um, kind of like the recipients of an egg or sperm donation are recipient parents or yes. recipients. Mm -hmm. uh, the, par the persons who are going to receive the child that is born through a gestational carrier arrangement, they're intended parents. They're the uh, the ones who are the parents in mm -hmm. Nevada recognized at mm -hmm. all times are the parents of the child. Mm -hmm. The carrier is truly just recognized as that. She is the carrier. She is the person who is giving this gift of assisting mm -hmm. in this process to have this child become here in this world and on behalf of the persons who are yes. going to then receive and raise the child. Mm -hmm. And it truly is a gift. I mean, yes. it's a truly altruistic act of kindness and it's very meaningful um, and I like that you pointed that out intended parent because most people when they hear that that sounds like a tricky term but that's literally what it is is these are the people who intended to become parents but for one reason or another needed to have someone carry the pregnancy on their behalf and so that is the carrier who is carrying the gestation or the pregnancy. But like you said, a gestational carrier is not genetically related, meaning the, neither the egg, well, not the egg, didn't come from her, right? Because the mm -hmm. sperm wouldn't have come from her, but the egg did not come from her. So that is a, genetic, a gestational carrier. Um, Again, like Catherine is saying, there's no statute in Nevada about surrogacy, meaning a woman carrying a pregnancy that was derived from her own egg. However, we do not recommend it. And that's because, first of all, uh, and Catherine can speak to this more, if a woman is carrying a pregnancy that is from her own eggs, she 
can legally change her mind, right, at the time of birth? Uh, you know, we don't, like I said, we don't have a traditional surrogacy statute, so we don't mm -hmm. have anything that protects that. It really right. is more akin to an adoption mm -hmm. at that point mm -hmm. in time. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there are plenty of women, for one reason or another, who choose to give the child that they're carrying up for adoption and right. not raise the child themselves. Mm -hmm. And that's really what a traditional uh, surrogacy is. is akin to. Yes. Um, you know, there, there's different ways of looking at it. It's a much more in-depth conversation than we can have yes. tonight. Yes, that's um, true. That needs a video all of its own. Yeah. <laughs> there, there's plenty of reasons against uh, recommended, re recommending doing that. Mm -hmm. um, and if you're considering even possibly doing that, that's something that I definitely recommend you need to speak to an attorney about. Yes, exactly. Uh, we have an email, and the question says, male couple, would you see Dr. Duke? Uh, and so I would, let's see, would you see Dr. Duke first to no steps or would you see an attorney first or would you see an agency? Okay. So the question is if you have a same sex male couple and they're interested in starting their family, mm -hmm. who should they see first? Well, if we have a same sex male couple, mm -hmm. they're absolutely going to need to have a gestational carrier. Right. Um, if they have, and donor egg, and donor egg. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, if they have, already researched the process, mm -hmm. um, then they might be at the time where they're ready to talk to a fertility clinic yeah. and, and determine costs mm -hmm. related to the, psych the cycles and the right. process itself. Um, but if they have not uh, started to even research, you know, it's the mm -hmm. very first time they're hearing about gestational surrogacy, yeah. you know, very first time that they're hearing about, you know, any of these processes, then they might want to speak with an attorney or with an agency. Okay. Um, so if you're doing it on your own, we typically refer to that as going indie or doing it independently. Mm -hmm. um, but you really have to have an understanding of the whole process in order to do that successfully. Um, an attorney who is knowledgeable in assisted reproductive technology can assist you in mm -hmm. at least guiding you along that path mm -hmm. if you want to do it independently. Um, what's great about using an agency, though there is cost involved with each professional you involve, so yes. using an agency is going to be an additional cost, but using an agency, they may help match you with your gestational carrier. Mm -hmm. They may help you find your donor, donor. egg. Right. Um, there are some benefits to doing that. So, you know, we said it earlier, it's such mm -hmm. a personal decision on how you go through this family formation process. Mm -hmm. um, I would say from my perspective, if you're brand new and you have no idea where to start, yeah. um, either speaking with a clinic mm -hmm. um, or like Dr. Duke yes. or speaking with an attorney like myself, either one is a good first step because at some point in time, we're going to, both of us are knowledgeable enough to be able to tell you, here's what you need to be looking at. Here's what you need to be looking for. And these are the persons that you need to start talking to. And very likely if you came and saw me and you haven't seen a clinic, I'm mm -hmm. going to be saying, here are some clinics that you need to talk yes. to. Dr. Duke would be on that list. Um, as a lawyer, we always give a list, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> we do the same. Um, we do the same. Um, I mean, for me, I agree. I certainly always encourage anyone considering using, whether it be donor egg, donor sperm, if it's a same-sex female couple, but especially if they're not married, but planning to start a family, same-sex male couple, not married, planning to start a family, I highly, highly encourage that you see an attorney. And so that is something that I think needs to happen early on in the conversation. I think if, in, as part of that, you're also involving a third known party or a second known party, meaning if you're single, male or female, but also have someone who has volunteered to donate egg or sperm or to carry your pregnancy, those conversations need to happen early on with a lawyer so that it's clear to everyone what this arrangement really means, uh, what the timeline looks like. You know, I have certainly encountered people who said very lovingly, I will carry your pregnancy. But then as we got more involved in going through the process, they realized that for one reason or another, maybe the timing wasn't right for them. But we'd already gone down such a long path that for the intended parent, that was pretty disappointing. And so I feel like when you involve 
the lawyer, the doctor early, those parts of the conversation do come up a little bit sooner mm -hmm. than one might think. And you never want to go into this based on assumptions. You want to actually discuss it, have it written out ideally and agreed upon, and make sure it's a sound uh, agreement. Absolutely. I, I absolutely wholeheartedly agree. Yeah. Uh, the other thing about getting uh, professionals involved early is that you'll know what to look for to mm -hmm. uh, keep yourself on the correct path. Right. You'll know um, what expenses to expect. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, uh, family formation through assisted reproductive technology is not an inexpensive process. True. So the last thing you want to be doing is steps two or three times because you were not uh, informed of what might happen early on. So it, I totally agree whether you're talking to a doctor or mm -hmm. whether you're talking to a lawyer, mm -hmm. you want to have someone do that. Yes. And, you know, the fear of that upfront cost for talking to an attorney, honestly, it's really a small, it's a, uh, it's a really <laughs> tiny fraction compared to finding yourself going through the same hoops over and over mm -hmm. because you're learning as you go, as opposed to someone giving you sort of a roadmap, particularly of questions to ask. Uh, knowing what the law is in your state. So for example, if you're watching our video right now, but you're not located in the state of Nevada, it might be different for your state. Uh, speaking of which, um, so we also have international viewers, mm -hmm. uh, Catherine, and sometimes I we certainly had a number of inquiries from patients and intended parents from abroad. How do we go about that and how does citizenship and parental rights factor into that? Certainly recently in the news we've heard of some cases where, uh, particularly for same-sex couples, where one parent still needs to adopt their child depending on which country they're dealing with, even if in another country it was recognized. Okay, so those are a lot of great points and a lot of areas, so I'm going <laughs> to try to answer them uh, as succinctly as I can. Again, mm -hmm. this is going to be one of those ones that we could probably do a whole other topic just um, on international heritage. Yes, um, yes. So Nevada's uh, statutes dealing with third party reproduction allow for us to uh, go to a court in the state of Nevada and seek a parentage order on mm -hmm. behalf of the intended parents. Um, so in Nevada, we can do a parentage order for a single individual. We can do a parentage order for married couple. We can do a, a parentage order for same-sex couple mm -hmm. that is unmarried. Mm -hmm. um, we can do a parentage order for persons that are not Nevada residents um, if the medical process occurs here in Nevada. Mm -hmm. um, and so we could obtain a birth order in Nevada that, or a parentage order that recognizes who the parents are and that would be valid in the state of Nevada. Mm -hmm. um, and so then in the United States of America, we have a process called comity that allows mm -hmm. those orders to be recognized in other states yes. for the purposes of saying it is a valid court order. Now, that is a little bit different than being able to, let's say, go back to your home state and get a birth certificate right. in that state. Mm -hmm. um, it is a, this is a much more complicated topic than mm -hmm. I want to get mm -hmm. into. Understood. But, yes. uh, we can we can get a parent order in Nevada mm -hmm. that can give you some recognition. And then mm -hmm. when we're talking about international parents, again, they can get a parentage order in Nevada. Mm -hmm. But then we need to work in conjunction with a knowledgeable legal counsel in their country, home country, mm -hmm. to determine is there any other additional steps that need to be taken in order to have that parentage recognition. Yes. or citizenship back mm -hmm. home. A child born in America, in the United States of America, even to international parents, is going to be recognized as a United States citizen, mm -hmm. but that may not necessarily mean that they're guaranteed to, let's say, have Chinese citizenship when they try to return right. back home to China. Um, and that's a very good point to know. So I suppose if you're coming from an international location intending to do uh get pregnant here in the United States using donor egg, donor sperm, or a gestational carrier, it would make good sense then to locate an attorney there in your home country as well prior to coming to the U.S.? Well, would it make it easier for you? Um, you know, I the good news about most of us that are in this field, we do have uh, connections in pretty much every other yeah. spot in the world that okay. deals with assisted reproductive technology. Very good. It's fine for you to have your own attorney um, before you come and talk to mm -hmm. an attorney that's stateside or if mm -hmm. you're dealing in Nevada. I'm going to 
focus on Nevada. But yes. if you're dealing uh, with in Nevada and you're going to use a, a clinic in Nevada mm -hmm. or a gestational carrier in Nevada, um, if you have your own attorney, that's great. Um, otherwise, a knowledgeable art attorney does have that network of connections and that's we can wonderful. help you find one. So yes. um, that's usually not a problem. That's good to know. That's good to know. Well, we seem to have one last question and then uh, we can start wrapping things up. So this final question is an email. Oh, so this one is related to female couples. And it says, we want to use donor sperm, but want to do a home IUI. Right? It's a T, but I think that's an IUI. Um, oh, home turkey baster approach. Excuse me. It worked for friends. Dr. Duke, is this something you can help with? How would we go about that? And how would both my wife and I get listed as parents on the birth certificate? So that would be part I'm kind of you. glad that we got this question because yes. this does come up. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, we'll do the medical side first yeah, and then we'll do sure. the legal side. I mean, in terms of the, first of all, there's really no true turkey baster. So I, I just want everybody to know <laughs> that. We use that word loosely, but it's not a turkey baster. Um, a home insemination is typically an intracervical insemination, meaning it's not one that's going all the way up into the uterus. Um, so as you guys might remember when we've done our prior videos, basically intracervical means the sperm is going right around the cervix here. Intrauterine is typically what's done at the doctor's office and that's where we use a special catheter and we put the sperm in the uterus itself. So we shorten the distance the sperm has to travel. Uh, intracervical insemination, um, if it's with someone you know, then basically it involves, it doesn't involve a doctor at all or any other source. Uh, if it's uh, intracervical insemination with anonymous sperm, then you contact your sperm bank and they will ship it to you actually, already prepared, already washed, and of course already built in safeguards like we've already talked about with that anonymous donor having been tested according to FDA regulations. Um, so how do I help? Well, again, if you're planning to do it with a known donor, then we can help in terms of getting that person tested, doing some counseling with and for you, with that donor. But we do nothing as it pertains to legal agreements. We have zero say in that, and I make that very clear to patients. Nothing that we discuss in the office with the donor is legally binding in terms of parentage agreements, etc. Now I'm going to let Catherine talk about this because this is really important and it's something that many people don't think about in such detail, especially same-sex couples, particularly if they're unmarried, but I'd like Catherine to also talk about even if they are married. Okay, so if you're thinking of doing something along these lines uh, where you're going to become pregnant at home and really the clinic is uninvolved, save and accept maybe Trust testing me. your donor. Mm -hmm. um, this is absolutely critical that this is the most, uh, this is where you want to consult with an attorney and you want to make sure that you have a valid legal agreement. Yeah. Um, the reason for that is we'll, we'll just start with, I'll try to take them off. Number one, your donor, if we don't have uh, something documenting that they actually were a donor could come back later on and try to insert themselves into your child's life and mm -hmm. into your life and insert mm -hmm. parentage. Mm -hmm. um, let's assume it was an anonymous donor so they don't know where the sperm went. You now don't have that problem. They're right. likely not to show up in your at your doorstep. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But you do have two persons who are intending to become moms. Um, Unless you're planning to both become pregnant and use two which does happen too, which does happen, mm -hmm. you, you know, mm -hmm. they, they choose the same donor and they both try to become pregnant at the same time. Mm -hmm. um, but unless you're both uh, deciding to become pregnant at the same time, and we're talking about two individual babies, or even if you do have two individual babies, you both both women would like to be known parents to whatever child comes. Mm -hmm. um, in that type of a situation, we in Nevada can do a co-parenting agreement. We can do it up front. In that co-parenting agreement, we would recognize um, how you plan to become pregnant. Mm -hmm. um, you know, who is the intended mother or intended mothers and what your plans are. If you're married, um, we have gender neutralized all of our Nevada statutes. So if you're married, it used to be that the husband is the presumed father right. of the child of mm -hmm. the wife, 
or you know the male and the female mm -hmm. we've gender neutralized so now there's an argument to be made that if you're married automatically mm -hmm. the person you're married to is presumed to be a parent yes again you probably want to talk to an attorney and find out whether or not you've done anything to have uh, really document that. Mm -hmm. um, the best thing I can tell you from an attorney's perspective is if you're considering doing something at home or a clinic is not involved, you no longer have the ability to say, dear clinic, can you please prove to the court that this really was a donor? Yes. Can you please prove to the court that me and my partner both intended to be parents? You don't have that person. We don't, so the no. only thing you would have to rely on is your legal contract. Mm -hmm. um, so I would absolutely urge you talk to an attorney, make sure you get things documented. Um, we do have some litigation here in Nevada with same-sex mothers where when the relationship, they're not married, mm -hmm. but when the relationship was great, they both intended to be parents, but they yes. really didn't do anything about it legally. Mm -hmm. And then when the relationship dissolves, unfortunately, just like in a divorce situation, mm -hmm. somebody wants to say, well, you're not really a parent. Right. Um, and that can be devastating mm -hmm. all the way around, devastating for the females involved, devastating the for the children involved. Mm -hmm. um, so you really do want to have that contract. Um, we can in Nevada recognize uh, two women as mm -hmm. parents on a birth certificate, mm -hmm. so that's not a problem. Mm -hmm. um, if we do the right contracts, we do the right processes, we can absolutely recognize both of the same sex women as parents to that yes. child. So, guys, uh, you know, a lot of what you're hearing today, I'm pretty sure, is new to you. Uh, for some patients, it's not new, but I know what I found most helpful with Catherine is you you can see she's very patient and she will explain it all to you and that's so critically important um, and as you can see there's so many different moving parts lots of nuances uh, it all depends on your own personal situation in even though today's topic is titled LGBTQI con legal considerations. It certainly applies even for our single heterosexual patients who are considering becoming parents. Um, we haven't talked about embryo adoption today, and that was deliberate. We will talk about that in a subsequent uh, video uh, with Catherine. And that's because a lot of what we've talked about today, while some apply, some do not, especially when it comes to things like compensation, etc. And I don't want to confuse or cloud the picture. We seem to have one last question. So we'll go with that and then we'll wrap it up. Thank you guys so much for participating today. And so today's uh, last question says email. And this one is a tricky one. Uh, if you've been raped, and you got pregnant and decided to bear your child, how do you prevent the rapist from legally claiming parental rights? Well, in that particular instance, again, uh, you would want to consult with an attorney. Um, you probably need to go through or possibly need to go through a formal termination of parental rights process. Um, if they have been criminally prosecuted for mm -hmm. rape, um, our statutes, I'm, I'm, again, I'm not a criminal attorney, but mm -hmm. I'm pretty certain that our statutes have been recently amended to um, create some presumptions mm -hmm. that they should not be entitled to have any parental rights to that child. Mm -hmm. But the what you would really need to do to make sure, especially if you did not uh, press criminal charges mm -hmm. and you were the unfortunate victim of a rape, um, you really need to make sure that you want to go forward with a termination of parental rights. A term mm -hmm. termination of parental rights is, uh, they, we call it the civil death penalty. Um, it's that serious. It's, it's, uh, it's the only way to ensure that someone cannot come back and assert their claims to mm -hmm. a child. Mm -hmm. um, if we don't go so far as a termination, then there's always a chance that they can come back. That doesn't mean that they're going to necessarily end up with uh, custody of the child or visitation rights to the child, um, but it doesn't mean that they can't try. A termination is the only thing that cuts that off. So. Well, thank you so much for that question. Uh, if you're someone who's currently in that situation, our, our thoughts and hearts go out to you. And we wish you the best. And of course, uh, there are attorneys in town who can help with that. Uh, is it fair to say, Catherine, that that's not exactly in your purview, but there are well, people I, you can recommend? I do handle termination of parental rights cases, so okay. that is something that I could speak with you about. Mm -hmm. um, it would be a, a, 
it's this, you know, it's not a third party reproduction question. Mm -hmm. um, it really is more of a, a true parentage question mm -hmm. or a, a termination question. But that's something that I do handle. Okay. Um, again, my, the some attorneys are just uh, third party reproduction attorneys, mm -hmm. art attorneys. Mm -hmm. I do have a practice where I have a good portion of my practice is devoted to third party reproduction and assisted reproductive technologies. But my law firm itself is a law firm that is devoted to family law exclusively. Okay. Mm -hmm. So anything mm -hmm. in the purview of family law is something that I could assist with or someone in my office could assist with. And you're welcome to contact me. Um, I'm with the Canaan Law Group. I'm a partner at the Canaan Law Group. Yes. So our website is www.canaanlawgroup.com mm -hmm. or my office number is 702-823-4900. Mm -hmm. And I'm happy to speak with you about uh, those concerns. Great. Can you repeat that number for us, Catherine? Sure. My office line is 702-823-4900. Mm -hmm. And uh, once again, I'm, I'm happy to set up a consultation to talk about any of your third-party reproduction questions um, or any family law questions that you might have. Excellent. Well, Catherine, thank you so much for making the time. This was so helpful. And I know for our viewers and those who will be joining later, this is going to be such a wealth of information. Oh, thank it's you. been so much fun. Thanks for having me. I look forward to doing it again. <laughs> yes. Um, so next when we meet uh, Catherine, we'll be talking all about surrogacy and the ins and outs, including the difference, as we highlighted today, between traditional surrogacy and gestational carrier status. And as part of that, we'll delve in a little bit into some of those uh, laws as they relate to cross-state uh, surrogacy, carrier, and even international. But for that, we'd really, really love your questions. So go ahead and send us your questions. Uh, it's about a month away, but it's never too early to start sending them in. Until then, thank you everybody for joining us today. Happy Thursday. It's Women's History Month. Happy Women's History Month to everybody and goodbye. Good, Good night. night. <laughs>